Get ready for a hilarious ride across the universe with the Cosmic Companion. Jaws, Claws, Life and Death with Jennifer Szymanski from Nat Geo Kids. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm Change T. Naylor. Now this week we're talking about Jaws, Claws, Life and Death and what they might teach us about staying alive in space. In a little bit, we're going to be talking with Jennifer Zemanski from Nat Geo Kids about their new book, Deadliest Animals on the Planet. But first, the boring part of the show with me in it. Oh. Both in nature as well as in space, staying warm, but not too warm, is paramount to survival. Oh no, a bear! I just want to eat my darn porridge in peace. You're the one who came into my house. Freaking elephants are known for their adorable ears. Why, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Now, Pachyderm, and I love that name, chow down about 70 times as many calories each day as a typical human being. This energy is stored as heat during the day and released at night through the motion of blood vessels acting like tiny electric blankets. Ah, hi, Ellie. Astronauts on board the International Space Station keep things cozy by pumping ammonia through the station's active thermal control systems. The fluid is sent through these panels, which act like ears, shedding the heat or not as necessary. Predators use their claws for hunting and survival. In space, robotic arms are used for various tasks, from repairs to capturing satellites for, re for return to Earth. Now, just as predators can strike an unsuspecting animal at any time in the wild, small meteors and space debris whipping around the Earth can spell doom. Doom. D-O-O-M. Doom. For space travelers. Infrared observations, looking at light which is redder than red, allows mission controllers around the globe to track potentially hazardous stuff in space and get spacecraft the heck out of the way. Rattlesnakes also track infrared light using facial pits located in front of and below their eyes. Instead of searching for danger, though, these critters are in search of a snack. Next up, we talk with Jennifer Zamansky from Nat Geo Kids about the deadliest animals on the planet. Join us for an interstellar joyride through the cosmos with the Cosmic Companion. Every week, our intrepid host, James G. Maynard, dives headfirst into the wildest corners of science, comedy, pop culture, and history. The Cosmic Companion takes you on a roller coaster of knowledge with entertaining dives into fascinating subjects. James is like your science-obsessed buddy who's always ready with a fun fact at a party. Oh, and what's yeah. a cosmic journey without some quality company? James rubs shoulders, figuratively of course, with the creme de la creme of the scientific world. We're talking brainiacs who decipher the laws of the universe, authors who craft stories that warp space and time, and developers who are building the future. Our cosmic guest list? Oh, it's star-studded. We've had the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson, dinosaur expert Steve Brusati from Jurassic World, the legendary ocean explorer Sylvia Earle, a myriad of astronauts, actors, and a constellation of other awe-inspiring guests. But wait, there's more. The Cosmic Companion isn't just any show. We've got AI on our side. Hello. I am AI. Huh. Did you know that is a palindrome? We're talking mind-bending visuals, snazzy animations, original music, and soundscapes that'll make your eardrums do the moonwalk. Are you ready to embark on this epic journey? Head over to thecosmiccompanion.net and get ready to laugh, learn, and explore the mysteries of the universe. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Jennifer Szymanski. She has a new book, Deadliest Animals on the Planet, uh, new from Nat Geo Kids, and we're going to talk about the deadliest animals on the planet. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Hi, thanks for having me on. Anytime. So, there's a lot of animals out there, tens of millions, I believe, known species. Uh, what, are, what are some of the most fearsome? 
Well, so um, I think one of the great things about this book is that um, there is something that will be fearsome for everyone. Um, <laughs> we've made sure that um, there are snakes and there are spiders and there are some undersea creatures that are, are pretty um, interesting to look at. Um, in addition to the, um, you know, the more standard bears, uh, polar bears, especially sharks um, and animals that, you know, we generally think of as being more deadly. Um, but um, yeah, the, I, I learned so much from writing this book. I, I don't, I don't know if I could, could pick one. I mean, some of the most fearsome ones are, or I found out are like house cats. Yeah. Like house right. cats are, are so, you know, we, we, there's such internet stars, right. And right. we just live with them. Um, but as predators, they have a really, really high kill rate. Um, they're about 30% successful um, for every hunt. Which, you know, sounds pretty good until you think about like a lion or a tiger, which might be 10% successful. So they're, as as predators go, they're good at what they do. They are amazing. And of course, you know, our cat Max thinks that, you know, he's a mighty hunter, even though he's an indoor cat, you know? Right. But right. these birds come yeah. up to the window and pounce. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, that's so funny. Now, I mean... One of the animals I absolutely love that I read reading about in this book, which I've never heard of before, is the slow loris. Okay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that. That's a pretty cool animal, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a great animal, and um, it's a primate. Um, so it you know it is related to apes, uh, humans, and and so forth. Um, yeah, I, I, when I was a kid, I used to love looking at pictures because the eyes were so big um, because they are nocturnal. Um, and one of the cool things is that they're one of the few venomous mammals mm. uh, where, I mean, we don't usually think of, of mammals as being venomous. I mean, that's snakes, right? Mm. Um, but what the loris can do is um, it will, if it fa fails to scare off a predator, um, it has patches on its like forearms that do secrete a venomous substance. So they'll lick their forearm, and then they'll bite and they'll get the bite in, or they'll get the venom into the bite that way. So it's not like fangs per se, it's venomous forearms, which I thought was incredibly cool. Yeah, yeah. You better just watch yourself, buddy. Oh, wow. Right. In here. Oh, wow. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Uh, and there are even animals out there that resemble dragons of yore, aren't there? Yes, definitely. Um, the Komodos um, do not breathe fire, but they are still a animal that I would say would be reckoned with. Um, they could come in at about 10 feet long. They're about 300 pounds. Their teeth are about an inch long and curved, and they have edges like a, like a saw blade. Yeah. And they have venom in their saliva. So, um, yeah, and they're also an animal that I've learned that um, I guess some animals when they hunt aren't, you know, as long as they, they get the kill at the end of the day, they're okay. Uh, Komodos aren't satisfied with that. They're an ambush hunter uh, and they'll hide out until a deer or something walks by. And then it's pretty much all in one go. <laughs> They, they take it down and, and that's it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I think when we think of animals um, hunting, you know, mm -hmm. first thing that comes to mind are ocean creatures. Right. Like this cute little great white behind me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but it, is the ocean or land more dangerous and for so, being prey or what? Well, so... One of the great things about this book is we got to expand what deadly means. So, um, you know, again, if we could think about deadly as being, are, are they deadly to humans? Are they deadly to their prey? Um, do they have a, adaptations that make them particularly deadly? Um, and when you take all that into consideration, it, it's it's the land. It really is. There's so many more, I mean, insects and, and um, you know, reptiles and amphibians. There's a lot of interesting characters in the sea, but if we're going by statistics, uh, my my votes for land for sure. 
Hmm. And of course, a uh, surprisingly dangerous animal on the land is, in fact, our friendly cow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, the it turns out that cows are responsible for about 20 deaths a year, uh, whereas sharks or like your friend behind you are only responsible for five or six. They just get a lot of press. Um, and uh, again, that has to do with proximity, right? We're more likely to be in, encounter a cow um, for day to day reasons, you know, whether <laughs> you harm them or... <laughs> You know, I mean, it just statistically, but there's still, you know, a 1,500 pound animal with horns. And if you catch one on a bad day, you know, it, it can be deadly. <laughs> could yeah. have a whole thriller horror flick about <laughs> these cows, right? Moo, right. you'll never <laughs> go into the pasture again. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Ah, that's hilarious. Um, I just, I just love everything about animals. What, what, what got you into science and learning and animals and education and all that great stuff? I, I just had, I had a really interesting path um, to where I am right now. Um, when I was a kid, I, I liked to be outside. I wanted to be a veterinarian. Hmm. Um, I was constantly rescuing injured animals trying to you know bring them back and um I started teaching after graduate school and I just became like I just fell in love with demystifying science for students uh -huh. um, and you know so this was a, a way and that those were college students and this was a way to sort of marry my love for nature and to still make it very exciting um for people you know kids but also adults um in a large, larger audience sense. Right, that's great. Yeah. And um, yeah, I was gonna say, one of the things I really, really love about the book is, you know, it's not, you would think that, you know, so many of these books might be organized by category of animal or, right. you know, how deadly they are to humans or whatever, but you just kind of went with a sort of haphazard, uh, way of organizing it. what you know you go from black widows to cats to you know great whites and what, what brought that about i think um well, a part of that was a the decision of the team that i worked with who were just fantastic um and i think one of the goals of that was really to again carry on that sense of deadly can mean so many different things right so, right, right. you know, like you like you said, a black widow is sort of classically deadly. But then to have on the next page something that appears in the picture quite cute, I think that sort of drives reader interest into honey badgers. Yeah, honey badgers are in there. <laughs> honey badgers don't care. <laughs> That's right. They don't. They don't. They have that thick skin and, and they're they're good with it. So yeah. it's so cool. Um, and so how can parents who have a kid that might be interested in science or animals, whatever, help, help encourage that interest? Yeah, I, interest. I always like to say that, um, I think kids are natural scientists. You know, anybody who has been around kids know they go through that why phase, right? Why this, why that? So I, I think, um, you know, we just want to stoke that curiosity and keep it going. And I think what you can do as they grow, and I mean, honestly, you can do this with friends, you know, older teenagers or, you know, adults even, is, is to turn that back on them and say, well, why do you think this happens? Or, you know, why is there no plants anywhere, but there's one weed growing out of that crack? Like, why, why you know, what's going on there? And then right. you find that out you know, together. And I just think sort of starts that process and keeps it moving forward. And it would seem, it seems likely that in the coming years, coming decades, we may, um, we are likely to find the first good signs of extraterrestrial life out there. Right. And I'm wondering what you think might be some of the lessons of uh, predators and deadly animals here on Earth that might extend to other life forms? That's a that's a really interesting question. And I would say that one of the things that I've learned about 
repeatedly is how things are adapted to their environment. And, you know, they have body parts or they exhibit behaviors that are really adaptive to the environment. And um, if I think about extraterrestrial life, there used to be a book that I saw when I was a kid where they imagined life on just the solar system planets, right? Mm -hmm. And what they would have to look like to live on Mercury, to live on Venus and so forth. So I, I just think that that's something that scientists will keep in mind as they're studying life on Earth and possibly life elsewhere. Great, that's wonderful. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Jennifer. It was great Thank talking you. with you. Thank you, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. And that was Jennifer Zemanski. Check out her new book from Nat Geo Kids, Deadliest Animals on the Planet. Or a slow loris is going to come get you. <laughs> <laughs>
So tune in, folks, on Feb 24th on the Cosmic Companion, where science meets mirth. Uh, thanks for watching. Check out past episodes as well as our short films at thecosmiccompanion.net. Subscribe to our Substack at thecosmiccompanion.com or follow us wherever you found this episode. I'm pretty sure we're there. Thanks. Say thanks. Say thanks, Terrence. Thanks, Terrence. Clear skies.